Carol Roth, a former New York uh, Wall Street banker uh, who, you know, woke up and went, who am, what am I, am I on the wrong side? Uh, and she has uh, done an awful lot of good. She's the author now of You Will Own Nothing, former investment banker. She, we, I have her on because I want to talk to her about BlackRock's new voting system. Um, but she has a couple of things I, I want to let you know. First, she has a new newsletter out, carolroth.com slash news. Sign up for it, carolroth.com slash news. Carol, I wanted to start with you because you are a former New York uh, investment banker. What is the fallout going to be on this Donald Trump uh, conviction and $355 million fine? Never been done before. Not even with the Gambino crime family. They never did this. Yeah, okay, so I'm just going to correct San Francisco investment banker because I don't want to lump myself in with all of those New York investment oh, bankers. Like that's that any be better. <laughs> <laughs> so right. this, the implications of this are horrifying for everybody who is in business. When you think about presenting your company in the best light, whether it is a startup firm, a venture capital firm, a private equity firm, real estate holdings, any publicly or privately held company that has adjusted EBITDA, they are saying, here's what we think the business is, but we're gonna put this in the best light. And what this particular judgment has done, in my opinion, has said, you know, even if somebody hasn't gotten hurt, even if, you know, the bank that you've presented this to or the investors said, hey, we made a ton of money, we're not a counterparty to the suit, that the state can come in and say, well, we don't think this is right. We've done our own calculations. We see that you have some, you know, numbers that you got wrong here, and we're going to charge you with fraud civilly, not criminally, civilly civilly and then put in some insane judgment that is basically like sticking your finger in the air and seeing which way the wind blows because there is no actual damages. The bank has said that they were not victimized, that they made a ton of fees. And so who really is the counterparty here? They're saying that there was some sort of ill-gotten gain. They made this up. And this has a incredibly disturbing implication for any business. If this is the standard, then basically I would say every business in the United States, somebody needs to be thrown in jail and assessed hundreds of millions of dollars because this happens throughout all of business. I will tell you, if Elon Musk was still in California, I bet he'd be shaking in his boots because if this can happen in New York, it could happen in California. Um, And they're already going after him with all kinds of stuff. Even if you're on the right side currently, if your company ever falls against the state on anything, you're opening up yourself for the end. I mean, uh, how how much of an impact will this have on businesses being and locating themselves in New York? Well, that's the interesting question because everybody thinks that it can't happen to them. Oh, it's Donald Trump. He's done, you know, all of these things that we've heard about in the media. This can never happen to me. And there's a lot of ego and a lot of hubris, particularly with the financial services and other companies that are based in New York City. Uh, we have seen some level of exodus based on crime, taxes, and yeah. you know other decisions. So obviously, the the ones who have been savvy have already gotten out of their started to decouple from New York. But I think the the when something like this happens, they see this this big personality and they say it can't happen to me. But why not? Why can't it happen to you? If you go against whatever the narrative is, if you go against the state and you know you say something that they don't like, this is, um, you know, as we've talked about before, sort of a soft form of social credit. You are not oh, yeah. aligned with what we want, so we are going to find ways to pen- penalize you financially. It's terrible. And it, it is absolutely terrifying. All right. So um, let me talk to you here. We, we have about uh, six minutes here to talk about okay. this. Um, Justin Haskins, who is uh, my co-writer of, of my book, um, we talk about ESG and all of this stuff all the time, go back and forth. He's much 
if you think I'm a pessimist, he's even more of a pes- pessimist. But he wrote to me the other day and he's like, Glenn, this is great news. The, you know, the U.S. ESG bills and the European ESG collapse and now companies are getting out. Even BlackRock says they're getting out of it. And I, and I, I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're entering the time of an election. And this is also what every progressive institution does. They are exposed. Oh, we're not going to do that with your gas stove. And then they do it anyway in another form. Are you, I mean, we should celebrate that we have them on the ropes, but we cannot let the pressure up. We have to pursue them because they're trying to make an escape. Yeah, I think this is the absolute perfect analogy. And I know, Justin, and we have some conversations offline as well about all of this stuff. And I do think there are a lot of things to celebrate because of the work that you and Justin have done, Glenn, your audience has done in in raising awareness, some of the state level leadership. We are seeing... Um, a lot of shifts happening. You know, we saw J.P. Morgan, PIMCO, State Street all extract themselves from the Climate 100 Plus pledge, which is basically financial institutions uh, cracking down on companies and, and trying to push them in, into this ESG dir- these directives. And so we just saw that happen this week. And part of that is because they are afraid of the legislation and uh, and being hit with lawsuits. In fact, BlackRock which shifted from the U.S. being part of it to just Europe being part of it Mm -hmm. uh, within, they said they cited lawsuits, potential lawsuits as one of the concerns. So this is, you know, coming from the New York Times, coming from the mainstream media, they are scared, but it's not enough. And, you know, that goes back to this new um, BlackRock voting initiative, proxy voting initiative, where they don't want to be the ones to take the blame and say, well, we're not pushing this. You're voting for it. Right. And instead of, you know, going ahead and um, giving you the ultimate choice on how to vote, they're going to give you options. But of their mm. options, almost all of them have to do. I know this is going to shock you, Glenn, with climate or climate impact or environment or social i know it's a social responsibility so i could have soviet communism chinese communism or uh north korean or or north korean communism but i can choose i can choose you get a pick got it all right wow that's quite a choice um so go ahead I was going to say, and it's um, the way they're doing it is is obviously they've been paying attention to your program because they're trying to really manipulate you in one direction or another. They have this one um, choice that's called the ISS Catholic Faith Based Policy. So you're going, okay, that's great. That's going to be aligned potentially with my values and patriotic values. But what they say is, quote, that it's aligned with social responsibility and, quote, the active ownership and investment philosophies of, gle- or I'm sorry, uh, broadly consistent with the objectives of socially responsible shareholders, as well as the teachings of Catholicism and Christianity. And then they talk about for, you know, social environmental uh, social impact. Justice. That- yeah, that they're going along with, you know, the the social and environmental uh, philosophies of Catholic based teasting. Yeah, I mean, they're real. They're yeah. really trying to to make sure that you don't read this and say, oh, this is going to be aligned with my values. But they're just pushing this in a different way to manipulate you. So now they can say that you're the one that voted for this. Unbelievable. So damn evil. Um, I, I'm looking at uh, all of the things that are happening, like the farmers, uh, you know, that's that's kind of calmed down now over in Europe because the politicians said, you know what? You're right. You're right. We're not going to push those things. We're going to hold. We're going to hold. There's an election coming out this summer. Yeah. And after the election, we'll bring that back up. But I think you're right. And I think these farmers just might be dumb enough to think that they won, but they didn't win. You, you cannot... This is like, uh, you know, any good war strategy. You cannot let them regroup, fall back and regroup someplace else. You must pursue them at some point because they're going to keep doing it over and over. They'll just pop up someplace else or under a different name or another new way to manipulate the reality. And you have to if you don't pursue them, you have to start all over again. Yes. Well, the farmers have obviously been very brave and they have been leading the way. And um, 
yeah, I think that they may have won the battle, but they haven't won the war. There was an article that came out in the Financial Times this morning about here in the U.S. about the um, amount of investment dollars that keeps increasing in terms of buying up farmland and that the average age of farmers here in the United States is 58. I would imagine that there's similar demographics mm -hmm. and issues going on around the world. So, you know, they may be placating and saying, OK, we're going to drop this. But we know through the fight against natural asset companies, uh, you know, some of these other proposals that are coming to the table and things yep. that they keep moving around, that they're finding other ways to achieve their objectives. I think the good news is, is that we are having an impact, whether it's the farmers, whether it's the, the listeners here using their voice. But I know it, it, it seems exhausting, but you've got to devote some part of every week to yeah. advocacy because we're in a situation where you, like you said, you cannot let up. They're on the ropes, but if you let them get that second win, they're going to come back and, you know, go back at you with some jabs and a, a right hook. Carol Roth, thank you so much. God bless. We'll talk to you again soon. Carol Roth, the author of You Will Own Nothing. She also has her new uh, uh, newsletter out. You can find it at carolroth.com slash news.